It is a pleasure to be seated with Diane Davis and Steve Conkin, and they are uh, working actors, two of the most respected working actors today, and they're starring in uh, a play called An American Daughter, and it's at the Williamstown Theater Festival uh, as we speak, and it's a Wendy Wasserstein uh, play. And Diane Davis, thank you for being Hi, with us. happy to be here. You play Dr. Lissa Dent Hughes, being nominated as uh, the U.S. Surgeon General uh, mm -hmm. for the position, a political appointment there. And uh, tell me, uh, describe for our viewers this 1997 play. So, uh, yeah, I play a, a doctor. She's an MD, PhD, and she is nominated for Surgeon General. And throughout the play, she has a, um, they have a reporter come who talks, um, who comes to interview their family. And through the course of that, there's a, there's a gaffe that happens that sort of derails her nomination a little and sort of highlights the, um, pretty much what we do to women in power or when they seek power. So this show was, I, I mean, written back in 1997. Yes. This was a forerunner of some of the uh, very relevant issues we talk about today. Absolutely. It's right. kind of brilliant on Mandy Greenfield's uh, part to bring this play here now because she, she saw it uh, when it was originally on Broadway and it's one of her most favorite plays. And uh, Wendy, I think, wrote it in response to a lot of the way that Hillary Clinton was treated when, as First Lady um, and, um, and what she went through and a lot of different, um, different incidents with women who were running for office or nominated for positions. Nanny Gates, there was one. And, um, and so she sort of wrote it in, in response to that, and now it's kind of amazing. There's a good dog over there. <laughs> it's kind of. Is there a dog in the show? No, there's not. It would be great if there was. was. I know it'd be amazing. We'd all. Um, so it's kind of incredible to be doing this. We talk about this sometimes in, in rehearsal about how with the with the election that's coming up right now, and she's and a woman is running for president, and um, and you know it's such a new. Ter it's new territory, really, for us as a society, is, is women in high positions of power. And, um, and it's, it's, we talk about in rehearsal how day to day the news cycle is going to shift how people see the play, how we interpret the play, how, you know, it's, it's really, really fascinating to work on right now. So, Stephen Kunkin, this really is a cutting edge play, as Diane has uh, indicated. And what is your role in, in this show? Uh, I play Diane's husband, who is a sociologist named uh, Dr. Walter Abramson. He's a professor at Georgetown University. And funnily enough, when you see the play, she, you forgot to mention that she is the daughter of a senator, a U.S. senator. So she comes from a kind of lineage. Uh, Lissa comes from this lineage of politicos. And it's really about uh, uh, one of the main things about, from a sociologist's point of view is where is the future power of the country coming from? And Walter believes it's coming from a multicultural, varied wellspring, which is a line from the play. And there are other people in the play who think it's, it's coming from the traditional sources uh, that we've been used to up to this point. And then you have female power, um, and this was written in 97, just sort of in this country really being um, championed in, in the likes of Hillary Clinton. It's a crazy prescient experience yeah. to, to sit in the rehearsal room and at the same exact time watch the two conventions uh, and hear all of the conversations happening right now. You could literally cherry pick lines from this play and throw them into, into something out of the headlines in the newspapers. Yeah, we say like, they're, somebody's <coughs> gonna say, you changed that for this for this production, right? And like, there's lines where you're like, yeah. somebody's gonna think that you changed it to make it more modern, and we're like, nope, not changed thing. Now, forgive me, uh, 1997, 20 years ago, I don't remember an American daughter as one of Wendy Wasserstein's major <laughs> shows. I mean, uh, yeah. it opened back then, and did it get, uh, 
a lot of traction at the time, or not not really, or... Uh, I saw it on Broadway. I remember seeing I was at Juilliard at the time, and so we had a kind of relationship with Link, through Lincoln Center, um, and I remember getting tickets and, and finding my way into the theater and being really incredibly moved and blown away by the play. Um, you know, strangely enough, like a fine wine, I think this play has aged in a way that will make the play even better than it was when it came out then. And it was pretty terrific then. It had a cast, both in a version that Dan Sullivan, who directed the production, did in Seattle and then also on Broadway. They were of amazing actors. Um, and uh, so the performances were all tremendous. But w we have enough space and enough time to look back on this play and be looking forward at this play. So it isn't just, we aren't just looking at a play that's about current events. Mm -hmm. We're looking about a play that's historical, that is also about the now and possibly the future. So it, there's so much to appreciate about this play now. At the time, I, I think it was being so grouped into how does it fit into the oeuvre of, Wend of, of Wendy Wasserstein? Is it better than or is it worse than? I'm in this Woody Allen movie now and I, it, that's about to come out and it's amazing how many reviews that I, I have seen that are all about where does it fit into into his movies? Is it better than this? Is it 50% better? Is it, and I think that's kind of what the experience then was. Well, ah, it's not quite Sisters Rosenzweig and it's not this and where is she going? And people didn't appreciate the play quite as much as just a piece of work in and of itself. So many uh, people have a misperception that being on Broadway or being in theater or in motion pictures or television, it's so exciting and exhilarating. Share with our viewers the rehearsal schedule here uh, at Williamstown Theater Festival, the uh, diligence and the focus that you folks have to apply to this uh, production here. Yeah, I mean, I think especially up at Williamstown where there's a, a somewhat of a short rehearsal period, so, um, so we we are on a we're on an eight hour day ten to six for our rehearsals. But then I do I go home and I study my lines some more. Um, and and it's it's I'm you know especially in this last week leading up to going into tech I'm 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 up till two in the morning <laughs> drilling the lines in my head because you want them in your head and your body and your, you know you don't want to have to think about them at all. So. Yeah, I know what you think. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because the the rehearsal period is truncated from like what you have in New York, but it's a unique gift that you sort of, you're removed from your life a little bit, and that's can kind of be a little bit of a gift. You're in this beautiful part of the world, and you're living without being able to go to your mailbox every five seconds and get the phone calls, and there's not really that much you can do to your life, and so you have this like this little cloud where you can create a kind of world around the play that is unique to doing like regional theater mm -hmm. and, and uh, summer stock theater, which makes it very alluring, I think, for actors who are used to sort of like, I gotta get back on the subway, I gotta get home, I have an audition. I, you just, when you're just four hours outside of New York, you pare your life down to really working on the play and it makes that experience actually kind of magical. Now, prior to the drill and the rehearsal, you've, of course, read the script, you've studied it, very thoroughly, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you're coming here really uh, well prepared in advance, I right? I got the offer a week before we started and I was in, um, in rehearsals for a workshop of something, so, uh, which, en which ended, so I came here right from there. I was at the Vineyard Arts Project and uh, so I had a pretty short amount of time, which is maybe why I'm up till two in the morning yeah. studying the script. You have the most lines, <laughs> right? Like these yeah. That. So, uh, so um, I feel like I, you know, at the, this particular process, I usually do a pretty significant. I like to um, do my homework. I'm a good student that way. I like to do a lot of research. I like to, I like to sort of figure out the world of a play and and figure out a little bit more about the person. And I, this was sort of a, a bit of arriving and flying blind, but. Um, but there's really no group of people I would rather fly blind with, and um, and and I I think um, no, it's and and uh, and it's it's definitely it's kind of something kind of exciting about it, something exhilarating about being like okay, we're just gonna go with our first instincts and shape them that way, and I yeah, I'm loving it. Uh, 
character development, Stephen and Diane, uh, all of the roles that you've had in theater, television, motion pictures, when you're given a role, when you're handed an assignment, and including here, let's say, with uh, an American daughter, what is the process you as thespians use to develop your character? What, what goes into it? What do you put into it? I mean, for me, for me it's, it's a little bit like being a detective. And so the first thing you have to do is go to the crime scene. And the crime scene is the material that is the written material. So it's the script or the, you know, um, the play, the, the screenplay. And you just go through it as often as you can to sort of pick up as many clues as you can. I mean, you're going to find out some really broad stroke things about the period and who the person is and what people say about your character. And you can decipher all the things, the, that you, the slalom things that you have to go through to, to, to achieve the story. And when you get to that point, then you start to, you start to develop an emotional attachment in a way to the character that comes up and begins to support all the other things that the playwright has given you. And somewhere it's it's like when they build, you know, a tunnel that you're there's one side being built from from this part of the, you know, underwater and there's another side coming here and eventually they're gonna meet when all of your instincts and all of the the I've had that personal experience and this reminds me of and all of those places where your emotional um, nerve endings are touching the play meet what the the author is is intending and that's why every play is is different it's the beautiful part of of theater is it's everybody's nerve endings are different than every other actor so even though the play is operating in a very specific way it's going to have to meet up with every actor who may come from a very very different place and that's going to make a different tunnel each time is there a benefit to uh working with a true life historical character uh, or a, a true life character as uh, movies say or theater TV is done or a purely fictitious character oh, I've never worked with a real life historical character have you? I have um, oh, maybe in the Nixon it. movie Frost, when, Frost you, Nixon. Uh, when you played in the uh, Frost Nixon yeah, Jim uh, Rest I played a character named Jim Reston who the, the New York Times yeah. right um, so do you, with a, a, a real life character, do you, do you Well, you feel an obligation. Or, you, yeah. you really do feel an obligation, first and foremost, if the, if the character is living or there's family of the person who's living, to, to have done your research, you know, to, to try to achieve a, a sensibility of that person. Now, in, a, in like the character of Jim Reston, the general public isn't going to know what he looks and sounds like. For David Frost, Michael Sheen playing David Frost, they did so you had to kind of really uh, achieve and for you know Richard Nixon you have to achieve that again it's that you don't want to just become an impersonator because that then Rich Little would have been our greatest actor <laughs> and, he's, and he's not um, lovely but um, you know you want you have to still do all of that other work and imbue the character with all of the life and make all of those choices and make them as complicated as possible and sometimes you're just guessing at that but there's a lot more source material when the person is alive but there is that obligation that can sometimes feel tricky and sometimes we, you know you it's it's almost the same as when there's an indelible performance you know if you get to play streetcar named desire and you know everybody has in their mind they have brando and so where you deviate and where you go down that same road is going to determine for some audience members how successful you are. And they're going to look at your role through the prism of that great performance. It's sort of that way too, which is, oh, I know Nixon and how much do you sound like Nixon? If you not, then, you know, or some people just look past that and they just want to see what you thought of the man. Like Anthony Hopkins in the Nixon movie didn't really kind of do a Nixon, but he did something... Uh, uh, from a I morph, mean, of, yeah, a of morph. some sort, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Diane, uh, <clears throat> for the record, you would like to play a true life historical sure. character, right? Sure, I would absolutely love to. I I imagine that it would be very similar in that way to playing. I mean, on some level, all people that I play live in real life. <laughs> mm. You know, I mean, it's it's investigating who they are and how they move through the world and. You know, I have a sort of theory that, you know, we all feel the same things 
but we all we think differently. So it's it's kind of about getting in someone's head and figuring out how they think and what they hear. You know what they what they think when they see tree or house. You know as opposed to what I do, what I think, what a, what what associations I have, and um, and so yeah, I would imagine that a historical figure, it's. A, you know, there's probably some added pressures from the fact that that, the people are exactly what you're saying, but on some level it must be kind of similar, sort of uncovering Mm -hmm. who who somebody is, what what makes them tick, how you identify what parts of, yeah, yeah. Fascinating, I would do any any of that, I love acting. Now, (laughs) Steve Kunkin, you uh, indicated a minute or two ago about the uh, tranquil, uh, peaceful, uh, lovely, environment here at Williamstown sure. Theatre Festival and uh, as we know uh, Williamstown Theatre Festival as well as most summer stock and uh, uh, regional theatre uh, especially in the nonprofit sector it's not uh, the compensation is minimal very often so speak speak to the passion and the uh, you know, desire uh, to to come up here. The uh, you know the the desire of being involved with your craft yeah. in a place like this. I mean, why? Again, it, it isn't for the compensation, right? Well, what are you getting paid? I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say nobody's going to make get rich in the theater, um, and you do do it because you love it, or you keep doing it because you love it. That being said, I, I do think, you know, it's a tricky road for me because um, I do very, very deeply, deeply believe that anyone who does a job, whether it's a job that they really love to do or a job that they don't like to do, deserves to be paid a, a, a living wage. <laughs> um, so I, th- that's pretty separate from Williamstown does pay well so I'm not that's separate from that um, I just don't want to get too far into the road of like everybody should just do it for <laughs> free <laughs> because we are trained professionals who've put money and time and a lot of thought and a lot of ourselves into what we do into studying it into into um, into working really hard at it and um, you know, I think sometimes we get thrown under the bus because people just assume we do it only for the for the love of it, which, of course. But like, you know, so on some level, does a doctor. <laughs> so anyway, uh, um, I'm maybe not answering your question. I, I no, just wanted I, to be I on think, the record that I, I think, think actors a, should be made. No, no, theater actors should make good amounts of money. I think it's a conflict that many actors struggle with yeah absolutely and I mean the other thing is there's a misperception there's a myth that maybe because you're on television or you're in movies that you're making oodles of money and that always isn't the case well, right? it, it's uh, you know it, it's, it's not the case uh, honestly the world of the actor right now and it's a big it's a big thing that we're negotiating as, as unions is not that different than what happens on the on the, uh, the meta sense in this country, which is they're killing the middle class yeah. of the, of the actors. There is a lot more proliferation of of TV with all of the great network shows, and it's a golden age of television right now. And every actor wants to be on these great shows, but there used to be even in commercials and in TV, there used to be a level of of compensation through residual payments and through your daily rates and or how you were structured into a show. Sometimes if you were going to be on five episodes you had to be a series regular. Now they have the networks have figured out a way to make you a recurring and that drops your compensation by a whole whole lot. And so the middle class actors are getting are really getting squeezed. An, an erosion of the protections that sort of allowed us to to not yeah to, to live and to make a living wage yeah go on, no no so it's just interesting because you do have the high highs and and I think a lot of people assume that like oh wow you're you know you work in a movie with Matt Damon and you must be getting you know twenty five million dollars also and clearly there's that and then there's and then there's th- th- everything else. Um, and it would be great if those two sort of those met in the middle and and sort of buoyed the middle class up. I think you'd you'd see a, a big change in the way that people approach the business. There wouldn't just be. I think we would probably all do it anyway. I mean, that's 
you, because we all love do love the it. passion. Of right. We, we love shouldn't. it. I mean, that's where we're kind of idiots. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> but we, but we do. Well, we do love it. We will. But that's why I think collectively we have to all stand as actors. Which is why I, I just brought this up right now, not to make this interview like political, but. Uh, um, but I'm playing a someone running for a political <laughs> office, so maybe it's just <laughs> in my in my brain. I think as actors, we do have to stand up and and we do have to say, of course we do it for the love of it. Of course we do. We love art. We love it. And we love, but but at the same time, you know, it's not a hobby. <laughs> but that being said, I, again, the uh, the myth, the perception uh, that I'm sure many of our viewers have. Uh, uh, Steve Kunkin, when you're facing Leonardo DiCaprio in a in a big scene, uh, or I know you've done movies and of course uh, a lot of television, Diane, and and you're you're, you're facing those people. There must be a rush and excitement, right? The, that uh, well, well, you know, there's people that you work with who you really admire, and you you know, and sometimes it's somebody like DiCaprio, and sometimes it would be somebody like, for me like. You know, we were talking about like Jerry Orbach, and it's like, you, if I got to work with him, I might not mean something to somebody else, but that is somebody whose work I had love, 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 and I was very, very excited to work with Stephen Kunkin. Oh, I mean, <laughs> and I, Diane. Um, but uh, so yeah, no, it's a thrill, and it's a thrill in one way because you know that a lot of people will get to see it because of who the person is. The biggest thrill is that is that when you find out that that person is putting his pants on in the same manner that you are, one leg at a time, and you're like, well, that guy's just an actor, and the, or that woman is an actor who's doing, you know, who's doing the same thing. They just, you know, happen to have a nicer trailer <laughs> and house and apartment. Diane, your thoughts on that? I pretty much, I completely agree, yeah. Cool. So uh, we talked about Wendy Wasserstein, and an American daughter. Are there playwrights that you would like to uh, perform their work that you haven't yet had the opportunity to, to do the work of a, uh, a favorite playwright or a playwright you admire? Um, Chekhov. I would just love to do some. Any, any of them, I would love to. How about you? Um, I have two playwrights. So if you're listening, <laughs> um, I, I really want to... You make some <laughs> living <ones. laughs> Right. Ones who could actually <laughs> hire me, Diane. Who <laughs> actually want you talk about it. <laughs> no, I, I would love to. And, uh, and I've, done, I've danced with, but I've never dated um, both uh, Bruce Norris, who I think is incredibly talented, who wrote Clyburn Park, and, uh, and uh, the, the Quams, who's great. And uh, also J.T. Rogers, who has a play right now at Lincoln Center called Oslo, which is just fantastic. And... Um, wh whose both their work is incredibly exciting, just in terms of how brilliant these guys are and how much they, how great the, the two guys are as, as human beings. I can I add one more? Sure. And can nope. I tell you Sorry, a we're slight, done. small <laughs> little funny story? I would say Tony Kushner is my other my the other person, and and um, when Angels I Angels in America, Angels right? in America, and um, Bright Room Called Day, and when when I when I first moved in with the man who's now my husband, we moved into this building in Brooklyn. And the landlord said, you know, this building is, rumor has it that this is where Tony Kushner wrote Angels in America. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, we have to move in here. We move into the apartment and in the mailbox, I start getting mail to Tony Kushner. And I was like, we're living nice. in the apartment. We're living in the apartment where he wrote Angels in America. Oh my God. So I saved the mail. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, I'm going to meet him someday. This is my dorky, dorky theater self. I was going to meet him once. And I did. I did a reading with him. And I got the mail. And I went, and I went out to him. And I was like, you are either going to think I'm completely bananas, or you're going to think this is charming and funny. But I told him a story about the apartment. And I was like, and here is your mail. <laughs> and he thought it was charming and funny. He didn't think I was bananas. But he missed those bills. And he yeah. was really <laughs> Well, uh, I'll give you another serendipity. You both live in Brooklyn, I yeah. believe. And Wendy Wasserstein is from Brooklyn. She lived a good yeah, part of her life. Midwood, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. from Brooklyn. So what a what a yeah. serendipitous. I know. Uh, We've been reading the right. biography, which is excellent biography if you get a chance to read it. It's like it is so well done. It's called Wendy and the Lost Boys. So one one issue I'd like to cover in our few remaining minutes uh, is the impact of the internet 
and the web and technology on working actors. Uh, Steve Kunkin, you have a website, uh, and I know uh, uh, Diane Davis, I've, I've read some interviews you've given on blogs, mm -hmm. uh, and of course today with being able to instantly access uh, photos of, of you folks in different roles, yeah. or video, or uh, you know, virtual television, we can call up movies and TV today instantly uh, versus, uh, you know, ordering a movie and setting a date to, to see it. I mean, how has this impacted working actors' uh, technology today? Is it beneficial or uh, is your website, uh, you know? Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, it's... I, which is a very good website. Oh, well, thank you. I, I don't update it nearly enough. It's like that weird thing where you spend a lot of time doing it and go, you know, they are, technology is a breathing, I mean, Ironically enough, it's it's got to be kind of a breathing organism, and that it, it's responding instantaneously to to changes, and that's what's so great about it because it is so, such a quick um, turnaround. Uh, you know, there the, you can find out anything about anybody now, and that's good and that's bad, um, and it's changing also in the way that we get work a lot of times you know people will vet us really yeah. quickly instantly kind of right yeah. 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 i mean i know i did a sh the show i i did a few shows ago it was the first time that someone was like oh yeah and then i i, I was, we were thinking about whether or not to bring you in for something and i looked you up on google and read some you know and i was like whoa i didn't it used to be you just went in for the audition <laughs> But you're not tied to being know. a New Yorker in New York and Los Angeles anymore. It's true. I can send, we can send you auditions. You can send from wherever you are. And I know a lot of actors who've moved out to Jersey and, you know, Maryland and f points to Denver or wherever it is. And they, they have great film and TV careers and even theater careers because now everybody picks up an iPhone and, and you have your audition uh, delivered yeah. instantaneously. So must you still be in... NYC or LA to make it as a working actor or can you be in St. Louis or uh, Miami or uh, you know I mean I think you probably have to make some and and some New York or LA connections for sure and then maybe once you establish you can you can set up your life somewhere else but you have to I mean you do have to meet agents and casting people all person at some point still know? comes down to NYC or LA right uh, I mean, I think, Di think I think Diana is right. I mean, I think you have to you have to probably put your time in in either of these places. But honestly, like I, some of the best jobs that I've procured have been on an iPhone from out of the country. You know, I th I think it's like you can you can do it, and you can live and you can live somewhere else. Not in theater. In theater, you kind of have to yeah, be in there. New York or maybe Chicago or, or Los Angeles, and then even like great. Theater cities come to New York for their auditions. So it's you know if you want to work, you know at, at the Cleveland Playhouse, you got to come to New York. Cool. Uh, Diane Davis and Stephen Kunkin, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. These are two very respected working actors uh, in theater and motion pictures and television today, and I predict uh, so many great things for both of you, you in so the much. future. Thank you for Thank you. being Thank you. with Absolutely us. Absolutely our pleasure. So, yeah. And don't forget to see uh, An American Daughter. And this is Danny Frank for GNAT TV.